Welcome to the Rumi Forum Luncheon Series in Washington, D.C. Today's discussion will be Muslim Americans, an in-depth analysis through Gallup polling. My name is Hazami Barmada, and I will be the moderator for today's Luncheon Series. We're honored to have with us today Ms. Dalia Mugahid, thank you for being with us, Senior an Analyst, sorry, and Executive Director of the Gallup Center on Muslim Studies. Dalia, along with co-author Dr. John Esposito, has written the book, Who Speaks for Islam? What a Billion Muslims Really Think. Her analysis has appeared in a number of leading publications, including the Wall Street Journal, Foreign Policy Magazine, Harvard International Review, the Journal on Middle East Policy, and many other academic and popular journals. She also directs the Muslim West Facts Initiative through the Gallup Poll, in collaboration with the Coexist Foundation and dis on disseminating the findings of the Gallup World Poll to, to key opinion leaders in the Muslim world and in the West. Thank you so much for being with us, Dalia. It's my pleasure. Looking Thank forward you. To this. In order to begin, could you give us some context on the Gallup Poll's initiatives on researching the Muslim community? Well, we have been uh, doing a global poll for some time. So in 2005, we started polling the entire world. 95% of the globe's uh, population is, is represented in our polling. And uh, so we thought that with so much information, it would be important to get some depth around uh, that much uh, breadth. So we started uh, different study centers. The first, the pioneering one, is the Center for Muslim Studies, which is what I uh, direct. And that center is focused on understanding Muslim societies around the world by doing scientific survey research so that we're able to analyze and advise on what Muslims really think using this uh, empirical tool. Okay, well I think the, the next question is, what, who are Muslim Americans? That's a, that's a great question. <laughs> um, who are we? <laughs> we? We did, uh, let me start by explaining how we polled mm -hmm. Muslim Americans, because mm -hmm. polling Muslim Americans is an is a incredibly difficult thing to do. Um, despite what it may seem, because they are a tiny percentage of the overall population. And so what normally uh, has to be done to poll Muslim Americans is to um, find Muslims where they are by looking at last names, by looking at census data around immigration records, uh, because if you simply call up at random American households, you have to call up so many people in order to find um, someone who self-identifies as a Muslim. Now, there are some issues with finding Muslims specifically by using uh, surnames and by using geographic um, concentrations, and that is, it's not entirely representative. So, for example, uh, a Muslim with the name of, say, Keith Ellison, might not make it into your sample. Uh, he doesn't have a Muslim sounding last name. He doesn't live in a place where a lot of Muslims you know, necessarily are concentrated. So the gold standard is to call and call and call and call until you randomly find a Muslim um, and you keep doing that until you have a big enough sample size. It's, it's almost impossible to do it that way because it's cost prohibitive. Now, we actually at Gallup decided to do exactly that, the, the, the sort of uh, almost crazy irrational way of, of trying to pull Muslim Americans, which is to call at random um, a representative sample of Americans and then find people who are self-identified as Muslims. And so the way we conducted our research is over 2008, for an entire year, we polled 1,000 American households a night. and by gathering such a large sample size, over 300,000 interviews, we were able to gather a large enough Muslim American sample size. And we just simply define Muslim Americans as uh, American households whose respondent I identifies as a Muslim. So that's how we, we did our, our research. And so it is truly the first ever uh, nationally representative um, study of Muslim Americans because it was done in this way. It, not only did we do it uh, by, by calling American households um, in, in this random representative way, but we also included uh, cell phone only households. And that's, that's another 
additional um, aspect of polling that you should ask about when you're when you're hearing about polling is did you include cell phone only households because more and more uh, Americans are moving to cell phone only households among Muslim Americans it, in 2008 it made up 22 percent of our sample so by excluding cell phone only households you're really excluding a big chunk of the population so those are the two uh, new and and what makes this study really groundbreaking and and very um, special. Just to ask a quick question, out of the sure. 300,000, how many ended up being Muslim households? I knew you were going to ask me that. Sorry, yeah. <laughs> now, I'll, um, I, of course, I'll tell you our sample size is 946, but I do, we, and we say this very clearly in the methodology, we do uh, as an organization, caution against trying to count people using polling. Um, it's not meant for that. That's not. Th it's not a tool meant for counting numbers of people. It's meant for understanding um, the makeup and the, and the attitudes of a group. And so, counting Muslims using polling uh, can can be. Um, problematic for several reasons but we we at least as an organization are not putting out a number of how many Muslims there are because we don't think that polling is the is the right tool so, okay. um, so who, who are these who are Muslim Americans well the the president uh, President Barack Obama in his inaugural speech called our nation uh, a nation of Christians and Muslims Jews and Hindus and and said that our patchwork heritage was a source of strength and so what follows is that uh, every uh, individual in our country contributes something. And so Muslim Americans are s simply no exception. What is it that they might contribute? What makes them unique? What, what, can, what do they have to offer in terms of enriching our society? Well, first, it's their racial diversity. Muslim Americans are the most racially diverse religious community in America. In fact, they have no majority race. Uh, the largest group <coughs> are African Americans who make up 35 percent of the total Muslim uh, American population. They're also young. Uh, they're the youngest, the h highest percentage uh, of uh, young people I of any group. So um, uh, roughly a third are between the ages of 18 and 29. Muslim Americans are educated. They're, in fact, after Jewish Americans, the most educated religious group in America. Um, Forty percent of them have a college degree or above. And that trend also applies to Muslim women, who are at least as likely as Muslim men to have a college degree. Muslim Americans are productive, so they are employed. Um, at least as likely as the general public, slightly more likely simply because they're young to be employed. So we don't have a lot of retired Muslim Americans. Most of them are either in school or working. They tend to work in professional jobs. So 30 percent um, are doctors, lawyers, engineers, uh, compared to 26 percent of the general public, slightly above, slightly more likely to be in a professional job. And many of them are also self-employed, so they're entrepreneurial. 24% uh, say that they own their own business, and that compares to 17% in the general public. Um, Muslims uh, also give in charity. Uh, this is a religious tenet, and 70% of Muslims say that they have um, given to a public charity, and that is slightly higher than the general public at 64%, but Americans in general are a very generous population um, in terms of giving to charity. Their political ideology is very diverse and so this was perhaps one of the surprises of our findings. Um, unlike uh, Mormons where the majority call themselves conservative, Muslim Americans are uh, evenly divided sort of across the political spectrum and they are the second most likely um, after Jewish Americans to call themselves liberal. Uh, so just I didn't mention this in the beginning the groups that the comparison groups that we looked at were Protestants Catholics Mormons and Jews as the other Muslim uh, as the other American religious communities that we're um, comparing to and uh, they are the second most likely to classify themselves as liberal now those are sort of the assets that they uh, offer um, society uh, okay. so based on your polling um, what did you find were the challenges 
that the Muslim American community faces, both as a community but in, in relation to other community groups in the United States? <coughs> Well, that, I mean, that's a great question. There, there is a lot that Muslim Americans uh, can contribute to, to fully um, unlock the potential, however. We have to address some of the challenges that this community is facing, um, which, which we uncovered in, in our research. The first challenge is that despite being um, highly educated, Muslim Americans are less likely to uh, report or to be classified as thriving. Their emotional well-being and their life satisfaction is actually slightly lower than it is for other Americans. So um, we, we have a, uh, an index that we simply call the thriving um, scale. And the way that you get classified into uh, one group or another is simply by answering two questions about how you rate your life today and how you expect your life to be in five years. And so it's current and then, and then optimism in, into the future. And Muslim Americans are less likely than the general public to be classified as thriving. Um, so 41 percent uh, classifies thriving compared to 46 percent of the general public. That's not that that's not really that significant, but when you look at young people, it's when it becomes, um, when it seems to be more of an issue. Muslims between the age of 18 and 29, youth, young Muslims, are significantly less likely than their age peers, than other young people, to be classified as thriving. Uh, and so there's this youth bonus that is missing in the Muslim American community. So among Protestants, 61% of young Protestants are classified as thriving, 69% um, of young Jews, and only 40% of young Muslims. And so there, there is a significant difference, especially among young people. Another challenge is Muslim Americans uh, lag behind in political participation. So while the majority are uh, say that they are registered to vote, they are significantly less likely than other faith communities to report um, being registered to vote. Only 64% of them say that they're registered to vote compared to 90% of Protestants, 90% uh, of Jews, 82% of Mormons. Um, another uh, interesting finding that could present a challenge is that Muslim Americans are the least likely uh, religious community we examine to identify with a specific political party. So uh, during the campaign last year, I remember reading several times that Muslim Americans were staunch Democrats. They're actually not. Um, only 49% of them say that they're Democrats. Now only 8% say they're Republicans, so they're not Republicans either. Um, but 37%, which is the highest of any group, just simply say they're independents. Now there is some, there actually is some pretty interesting data around where they classify mm -hmm. themselves because most people who classify themselves as conservative also say they're Republicans. I mean, it's a, the majority of conservatives are also Republicans in our data, except with Muslim Americans. The majority of conservatives are not Republicans. So there is some, uh, there's some um, potential there for the Republican Party to win over some Muslim Americans if they were <laughs> to reach out and maybe change their rhetoric. Um, Muslim Americans' monthly household income uh, reflects the racial disparity of America as a whole. So that's another challenge that Muslim Americans really face, is they have the biggest disparity within the community in their um, socioeconomics uh, and in their, uh, in their, especially their income. And it falls exactly along racial lines. Now, what's interesting is that's not unique to the Muslim American community. That's actually a reflection of being American because okay. that same racially based uh, <laughs> economic disparity is seen in the general public exactly along racial lines. So there are many challenges that, that's, uh, that the community or the communities, the various Muslim American communities are still facing um, as they move into, the, into full uh, integration in, in the United States. That's very nice. You've done a, a good job of painting, I guess, a picture of, in essence, how the Muslim community is a cross-section 
of the American larger public. Mm -hmm. um, how do you feel like the Muslim experience relates to the larger picture um, in America? Is it unique to the Muslim community? Is it American experience? How do you, how would you categorize that? I think what's really interesting about the Muslim uh, American experience is that it is uniquely American and uniquely Muslim uh, at the same time. I mean, the Muslim American uh, makeup is is nowhere else in the world. It can really only happen in America that they are as diverse as they are. That um, that they they come back from so many different backgrounds. Uh, so. A friend of mine was visiting me um, a few years ago from Egypt, and it was it happened to be Eid, the holiday uh, after Ramadan, and so we um, went to a huge congregational prayer, um, f and Muslims from all over the D.C. metro area were, of course, all there. And you know, nothing about it seemed very striking to me. But she, I looked over, and she was literally in tears, and she said, mm -hmm. "The last time I saw this kind of diversity was in Mecca." And I thought, you know, that's that's really true, and it and it really doesn't exist anywhere else. So it is a, this uniquely American phenomena. Mm -hmm. uh, but at the same time, no other community within America is that diverse. Uh, so there is also this aspect of it being a uniquely Muslim phenomena as well. Uh, and so I, it's I think it's a it's an important group to to continue to look at and to uh, really um, see how how they continue to evolve within mm -hmm. the American uh, story. Well, that's definitely very important, also the follow-through of your research. And, and I know it's been picked up by a few academic sources and publications. What do you see as the long-term implications of such research? How do you hope that it will be used and by whom? I think that this research is important. First of all, it's, it's just the beginning. We really see this as a foundational study. There's more questions. Mm -hmm. uh, we've, you know, we've created more questions than we've answered. And so it is ongoing. But I, I hope that this study will be the foundation of, um, of a lot of things about, uh, first, how, how reporters report on Muslim Americans, who, who are their representatives when they go and try to talk uh, to people who are supposed to be representing the, the community. Um, oftentimes, African Americans are completely not present when Muslim Americans are being reported on, uh, even though they're the largest group. So that's one thing. Is, it, it just sheds light on who, who these people really are. Not only news reporting, but media, uh, in terms of creative media, Hollywood, um, can get a richer, more nuanced picture of what the community's like. Um, policymakers, in, in trying to think about how does one tap into the potential of this community? Um, how, does, uh, how does this community get seen as a brain trust in solving um, global problems? I, I am hoping that this, this uh, report can be uh, a resource for, for those kinds of discussions. Have you felt like there was any challenges in getting the report out there to date? I know you guys have had very positive um, feedback, but have there been challenges in trying to well, I think the I mean the biggest challenge uh, is just simply conducting the study. I mean the study was a huge effort. Um, uh, it did take a full year to get enough of a sample size, and that's that's a challenge in itself. Usually, your your field period is a week or two weeks, and when your field period is a whole year, now of course all of our comparison groups are also over a year, and so there are challenges in terms of well, how did things change over a year? 2008 was a very turbulent year with a lot going on. Um, and so there, that's, that's just a technical challenge of mm -hmm. just having um, such a wide uh, lens and taking all of that data in and then, and then looking at it that way. Wonderful. I, I want to turn this slightly more personal. Now, you are one of the, you're the second, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Muslim to be appointed to the White House um, faith-based and community initiatives. Mm -hmm. Um, initiative there. Um, what type of feedback have you gotten and what implications do you think that has both domestically with the new administration and internationally um, as we know that you, you did get positive feedback and you got picked up by a lot of international media outlets uh, because yeah. of your recent appointment. Um, so if you can reflect on that uh, personally. Well it, it's interesting because of course we just started at the council and I felt I feel like I've gotten way more credit before I've actually <laughs> done anything so uh, feeling a little guilty about that um, because you know 
really we haven't done anything yet it's it's just the very beginning just been appointed uh, but the Middle Eastern media um, has just been to my incredible surprise very very uh, receptive and has really picked up the story of um, my appointment um, so I was born in Egypt, so I wasn't surprised that you know maybe Egyptian media was interested. But in fact, it seems to be wider than just Egypt, and and really the whole issue. I mean, it's interesting what what the stories and the way sort of they're framed is really quite positive for America. I think because the way the stories are are talked about, especially in the comment section, is uh, focusing on my hijab and you know the fact that. A woman, a Muslim American woman, has been appointed onto this council, and she happens to wear hijab. The subtext is, of course, hijab is outlawed by law in most of these countries and in higher government um, offices. And so there's a very strong message that America's that you know there's a democracy here and and things are different. And I and I think that's a positive thing. Um, there are people who are also uh, Taking it, even though I mean, taking just this as as another sign of sincerity on the part of the Obama administration that they are interested in um, hearing the views of Muslims and uh, and this idea of respecting Islam is is sincere. Mm -hmm. So uh, there's there's been a huge reaction, uh, which I think is a positive thing for for the prospects of uh, building greater mutual respect. Um, but I, I'm still anxious to actually get to work uh, and make a difference. Well, I, talking about, you, you said you haven't done much. You've done absolutely amazing work, and I'm sure your research is, is definitely very helpful to a lot of people. So thank you, so thank you to you on that. Um, but I, I do uh, think that what you said with regards to the symbolism um, and the fact that you're appointed um, as that has done a, a great deal um, following on Obama's you know, reaching out to the to the Muslim world via Al Arabiya and then his trip to Turkey recently. Um, what other type of, um, I guess, uh, research do you guys plan on doing as a follow up to this research? But then also with regards to shaping domestic policy towards how Muslims are categorized and how that policy in turn affects Muslim experience here in America. Well, we we can. I mean, we continue to do this research. Uh, we we are about to come out with uh, a major study on Muslims in Europe in in May, uh, which will launch out of London, our London office in Gallup, um, and then we're hoping to get uh, some uh, our newest research on Muslim majority countries out um, early fall, uh, and and really look at has has anything really changed or not? And I'm very excited to see the answer to that question. I really don't know what to expect. Um, so we will continue to do our research. And, and our, uh, our mission at Gallup, and it always has been, is to inform um, leaders with the wisdom of the people. And so Dr. Gallup, when he started our company, he basically started it with a simple premise that if democracy is about the will of the people, someone should go find out what that will is. And that's really what we've been doing for 70 years and, and now have just taken that um, to a much wider scale. When did the Muslim Studies Department actually begin at Gallup? It was late 2005 is when we started uh, this Was it degree. a result of um, the lack of attention or the lack of knowledge, you feel? Well, it, I mean, our CEO tells this story that's almost become a legend at Gallup, <laughs> but uh, he says that he was watching a news conference and uh, Rumsfeld was asked, right, it was right after 9-11, and Rumsfeld was asked, how, how do Muslims feel about the attacks? And his response was, well, I don't know. It's not like you can take a Gallup poll. <laughs> and so <laughs> uh, that was when Jim decided we got to we gotta take a Gallup poll. And we, we, were, um, we went into nine predominantly Muslim countries in early uh, 2002. In fact, we started even late 2001, uh, and did this, did f our be the beginnings of our uh, our study of Muslims. And then in 2005, we dramatically expanded that to cover the entire world, um, which would cover in our research 90 percent of the global Muslim population. So it did. The inception was this idea that 
leaders have no idea what these people are thinking, and yet we're so deeply involved. Um, and uh, Gallup felt that it had an important role to play. I, I do have one uh, question just that keeps popping in my mind. Um, if you were to do similar research in, say, a Muslim country, um, do you think that people would be as frank and as open about their answers to your, your questions? Well, that's a very good question. There's someone here who writes all about that um, <laughs> and the problems with polling in the Middle East. Um, we, you know, this is, a, this is of course a challenge and we, we recognize that it's a challenge. Um, and we have ways that we try to lower the, ch you know, mitigate this issue as much as we can. Um, but really, at the end of the day, social desirability is not something exclusively uh, you know, exclusive to the Middle East or to the Muslim world. And we have to craft questions to get real answers from people um, all, all around the world. Um, and we, I mean, we continue to do this research and, uh, and believe that it is, uh, you know, like, like uh, Winston Churchill said about democracy, the worst system except for every other system that's been tried. So, <laughs> You know, polling is not perfect, and we're the first to admit that. But done right and done um, robustly and scientifically, mm -hmm. it is, it's the best tool we have uh, to understand populations and societies accurately. And do you guys have any of your qualitative research um, published or the quantitative? I know you guys have the, the, st the charts and that sort of thing you could find online. What about mm -hmm. the narratives? Did you guys collect narratives from people? We didn't collect narratives on Muslim Americans because it, of just the nature of the study. It was every day, and it was, and it was for every you know every American. So the study, especially since it's a phone study, has to be rather short. Um, so no, we don't have narratives, but we do do um, focus groups and uh, and other qualitative research to to help us understand our quantitative research. You're saying that Muslims have uh, short attention spans? <laughs> <laughs> Americans have <laughs> short attention spans. <laughs> well, um, thank you so much. That's definitely very uh, insightful. And, and thank you for all for the research. And if you don't mind, we can open up the floor to some Q&A. I would sure. like to a ask you all to stand and uh, <coughs> hold the mic close to your mouth, please, and um, announce yourself uh, when you ask questions. So do I see a mic floating around? Thank you. Can you hear me? No. Thank you. Yes, yes. Just a second, please. Try again. I <laughs> Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, well, I'll just shout. Uh, I'm, my name is Dave Pollack. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm from the Washington Institute for Near East Policy, and thank you very much, Dahlia, for a really, really interesting and important <coughs> presentation. I wanted to just ask if you have any additional information you can share about the uh, demographic makeup of American Muslims. You mentioned, I think, that African Americans are 35 percent of mm -hmm. the total, and who are the others? Who are you, the others? Do you have that by national ancestry or other categories or what? <coughs> well, it's a, I, I, I'm happy to answer that, but I do want to just put out there that the entire report is available to download for free uh, at the website MuslimWestFacts.com. And uh, you can click on the link and you can download the entire report and you can also watch the press conference and uh, see any, all the media. Uh, uh, coverage of the report. So the, the question is what are the other groups? Um, and let me explain how we did it. We, we did not, like I said, because of the nature of the, the study, we asked the sort of conventional race question. We didn't ask uh, more of the what you might expect in a purely Muslim study where you're asking people where they're from or they're Arab or whatever. We just did sort of the, the conventional um, race categories. So 35% are African American, 28 are white, 18 are Asian, and 18 are other. Um, in addition, 1% are Latino, uh, Hispanic Muslims. Um, now. The question is often, well, where, where are the Arabs? You know, wh which category are they in? Uh, and most studies have found that, um, you know, who, who, who've asked people, 
the conventional version and the sort of more detailed version that the vast majority of Arabs do classify themselves as white, and that is their um, their official classification in in the census is is under white. So 28 percent, but that would also include not only Arabs but um, Bosnians, Kosovo's, uh, white Americans who convert to Islam. Mm -hmm. So that's Turks. that's that group. Turks, of course, yes, Turks, of course. Um, uh, Iranians, yeah, Iranians. Uh, how did you guys quantify, I guess, or, or qualify youth? Because you, you brought up some statistics right. about 18, youth. It was just 18 to 29 was our okay. definition, the age. And then the same brackets were? were for across the across groups, the yeah. Okay. Thank you. I don't want <coughs> to. Mariani from um, Georgetown University Center, Language Education and Development. How do you, um, in your research, do you um, look at your <coughs> answers based on um, the African American Islam or Muslims that and how they answer the question versus everyone else? Because I would think that they would have a different twist on things and the way they they look at um, issues. Mm -hmm. And do you do you? Absolutely. Well, we, we uh, they're not, well, they do have a different view, but they're actually not totally unique. So we actually, one of the chapters in the report is a, a racial break, uh, breakdown. So we compare um, white, African American, Asian, and other as the four groups on all the questions. So you can actually see how they differ from each other and then how they differ from their co racial counterparts in the general public. So we actually have all of that in there. And African Americans um, are different in some ways, and in some ways they're very similar. So socioeconomically, they are on the lower end of the spectrum. Um, but so, for example, African American and Asian Muslims are on opposite ends of the spectrum. Asian Muslims uh, Asian American Muslims are the most affluent, African Americans are the least affluent. But then when you look at a measure like religiosity, they're exactly the same. They're both very high in that. Uh, interestingly, when, it look, when you look at thriving or well-being, African Americans are on the lower end, but actually they're equal to white Muslims. Very interesting. White and black Muslims are both quite low, and Asian and other Muslims are a little better. So the data on, uh, with the racial breakdowns are, is, is quite uh, informative, I think. Thank you. My name is Sonia Kamber. I'm with the Assembly of Turkish American Associations. Thank you very much for the um, uh, for your lecture. Um, my question is more related to policy implications of your survey or, or political implications. Let's say now your sur uh, your the, the findings of your survey demonstrate that this is a very diverse group, and there are actually Islams. Uh, in the United States, not only one Islam, because you know all these groups interpret Islam in a different way, and they go to different mosques. Mm -hmm. They have different groups, uh, uh, and for instance, in Germany there is a similar uh, initiative, faith-based initiative, which is called the Islamic Conference, and it is such a controversial issue whom to invite to this conference. And the German government is most of the time very much puzzled. So my question is, um, how within this diversity, how do how can we manage to become a u united voice, considering that being uh, unified is very important uh, to have an impact on uh, American society and politics? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Well, I think that you know. Uh, you made quite a number of points. So I think one of your points was that people are interpreting Islam in different ways in America, which is of course true. Of course, but that doesn't that, that doesn't necessarily fall along racial lines. So, you know, there are just different um, interpretations or different um, ideologies uh, that that exist in America. That's one thing. The other thing is, you know, with such diversity how are people going to unite to make an impact? 
I think the the biggest uh, I mean it's it's going to continue to be a challenge but I I would just think about it uh, in another way. If we look at Christianity uh, or the Christian faith or the Protestant faith or even evangelicals, they have their own racial diversity, uh, I mean, at least black and white, and they're no more united really than Muslims. I mean, if you look at you know the idea that Sunday is the most, Sunday at 10 o'clock is the most uh, segregated hour of the week, that actually doesn't tend to be so much uh, the case of m mosques, especially in towns where um, smaller cities where there isn't enough, there aren't that many Muslims, actually all the mosques I've ever attended, because I've always lived in medium-sized cities, have been incredibly diverse. So the, the, the division within the Muslim community I think sometimes is rather uh, exaggerated or, or it's seen in, in a way that other faith communities aren't looked at in the same way. Um, so evangelicals aren't really racially united uh, in many cases. There is a racial d division just as there is in the Muslim American community. But how, this idea of how uh, will there be political mobilization, I mean, I, I don't think I have a good answer for you. I would just say that the main issue is, is really around priorities. And for a long time, there was a division along not really racial lines, but more priority lines, uh, where some groups were focused on um, social justice and poverty in America, and others were very focused on foreign policy. And I think it's only by integrating those two priority lists that people can come together on one platform to make an impact. Do I see the mic floating around, or are you just holding it? Does anyone else have any? No, I, I, the mic's over there. I was wondering if you have any more questions. There are no more questions. Well, do you have any last follow-up points before we? I I want to end by talking a little bit about um, how Muslim Americans are. Uh, a uniquely American phenomena or the uniquely American experience by, by talking a little bit about the what they actually share with other Americans as well. Um, one thing uh, that they share is around their the value of faith and so Muslim Americans like other Americans are highly religious uh, so they resemble Protestants and Mormons in their level of religiosity. Um, they also are similar to other Americans in um, <coughs> women's employment. So in, in the Muslim American community, nearly 60% of women work, um, and that's similar to 55% of women in the general public. Uh, they attend religious services in a similar, uh, there's a similar trend. So 41% uh, of Muslims attend a religious service at least once a week, and that's similar to, it's actually exactly the same as Protestants at exactly 41% as well. Women and men attend in, in equal percentages, uh, which <coughs> is similar to other faith communities in the United States. Quite different, though, from the pattern you might see in some Middle Eastern countries. So, for example, in in uh, Egypt, women are significantly less likely than men to attend mosque um, on a weekly basis, um, whereas Muslim Americans are slightly lower uh, in their percentage of being classified as thriving than other Americans, 41 percent uh, overall versus 46. They are significantly more likely to be thriving than Muslims in other Western countries. For example, in Britain, the percentage of Muslims uh, who are classified as thriving is only 7%. So in, in many ways, despite their obstacles, Muslim Americans are just that, Americans, and really reflect the nation's strengths as well as its struggles. Wow. Well, we're a very intensely diverse audience. I think we have another question. Oh, go ahead. Jan, Rumi Forum. My question is about Mr. Rumsfeld's question. Mm -hmm. After this poll, do we know how the Muslim <laughs> Americans feel about the attacks? Uh, 
We don't know uh, what Muslim Americans feel about the attacks um, because we've never asked them. Uh, but we do know how Muslims felt about the attacks around the world. And the majority simply said it was morally unjustified. Just to clarify, you guys are talking about the attacks on 9-11? 9-11, yeah. Okay, because I heard some additional questions out there. Do you, uh, just a, another question, I have all these questions, it's great research, I just want to dissect it and, and use it in everyday life. Um, how do you guys, long term, do you guys plan on, I guess, following on one of the questions of one of the audience members, on dissecting self-identification <coughs> within Islam? So taking mm. that same data and then categorizing it by categories of, of how people self-identify, whether it's Sunni, Shia, uh, mm. those sorts of things. Well, it would, pro it would be difficult to do, um, for so mostly because the sample size would just have to be enormous to, mm -hmm. to be able to do anything um, significant when you are cutting the community even further down in terms of, you know, different uh, ideological or interpretive um, schools of thought. So that, that would be more difficult to do. Um, but what I hope to do more of is look at um, demographics in, in a little bit more detail, uh, background, um, who, where do people come from, are people first generation, second generation, um, looking, looking at maybe in greater detail. The, the other issue with, with sect identification is m actually most studies have found that most Muslims don't, mm -hmm. don't identify with a sect or don't want to identify with a sect, um, even in places that might seem very sectarian in nature, they're kind of careful to say, I'm just a Muslim. What do you think that's attributed to? Well, I mean, I think it's attributed to the, uh, the desire for Muslims to, to be one, one united um, community. Uh, it doesn't always play out that way, but that is the desire. Uh, I think among most Muslims. When we ask Muslims, for example, around the world, um, what can Muslims do to help themselves? One of the most frequent responses is be more united. As an American community? Oh, this is around the world, actually. Okay. I mean, in, in all parts of the world, uh, it, even, I mean, uh, even in, in communities that are a sectarian minority, like in Iran, that's what they say. Muslims should be more united. I mean, everywhere else, it's not. It's not even unique to one part of the world. It's very interesting that that's a striking, reoccurring theme in the data. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. Just to end on one quote, I, it's, it reminds me of this: is diversity is the art of thinking independently together. So I think that sums mm -hmm. up the Muslim American experience. We want to thank you so much for being with us, and thank you all for joining us today. Thank and that concludes our um, show for today. Uh, thank you.